welcome to the fifth parallel dialogue as part of the series of network conversations. What will Ropius do as center later, organized by Conexiones Improbables as a part of the New Europeans Initiative, the New European Bauhaus. My name is Begoña Lopeta Verasturi and I am from Conexiones Improbables. But today it will not be me, it will not be our organization, Conexiones Improbables, who is moderating the conversation. But it's parallel dialogue that is taking place in this second phase of the cycle of conversations is being led by different organizations. So today we have with us um, Michal Latki and Martin Mohis from Creative Industry Cosice, and they will moderate today's dialogue. So thank you and welcome Martin, Michal. And welcome all, and I'm really glad that you accepted the invitation and I'm really looking forward uh, to your presentations and statements and uh, the fruitful discussion at the end. So we, we have a very short introduction just uh, in a program just for 10 minutes and uh, Roberto joined us as well. So I would like to ask him to make a short uh, framework of where this conversation is part of and where we are heading with the whole program. Thanks, uh, Michal. Thanks, uh, Begonia. Good morning to everyone. I would like to, to greet you, to greet you all um, on behalf of Conexiones Improbables, hybridizing to innovate, a partner of the European Bauhaus and promoter of this cycle of conversations with the, with the title of what would Gropius do as a relate. First of all, I would like to congratulate and thank Michal and all the Creative Industries Cosice team for the extraordinary panel of uh, experts they have convened for this conversation. They are always easy to work with. Our experiences could not be more satisfied. Um, I am especially happy to meet some good friends today in this conversation. I'm sure it is going to be very, very stimulating. Gropius, as you know, founder of the Bauhaus in 1919, was an architect and, and thought of architecture and building as the ultimate creative expressions. But if he were here today, what would Gropius be? A maker, a community activist, a designer, a technologist, a relational artist, an urban planner? In the conversation we, we had yesterday about future of all places and territorial cohesion, Someone said that Gropius would today say emphatically, I was wrong, or maybe not. Today we continue with another of the seven conversations that we are promoting with which we want to contribute to enrich the discourse on the New European Bauhaus and how from different disciplines and perspectives, an inclusive, sustainable and beautiful Europe can be built. Today we are going to talk about sustainable and inclusive cities. I live in, in, in Vitoria Gasteiz, uh, European Green Capital in 2012, the administrative capital of the Basque Country in the province, Alaba, where the rural environment plays an, an important role in preserving the perhaps the greatest diversity of natural ecosystems in Europe, but which at the same time has the highest industrial uh, percentage of, of GDP in Spain and also the highest per capita income in, in Spain. A territory like the Basque Country as, as well, uh, which has very active social policies. But is being green and having important social services enough to be a sustainable and inclusive city or territory? How does the New European Bajos tie on us? Perhaps from our point of view, the answer to, to this question lies in reinforcing the transdisciplinarity and specifically the transversality of creativity with all social and productive activities, bringing new perspectives to our way of life, to the conception of our activity spaces and our homes, to our production and consumption systems, to our educational model, to our ways of relating internally and with the outside world, and reinforcing our collective commitment to sustainability and the well-being of people anywhere. And to do so for an inclusion, trying to ensure that no one is really left behind. Our societies are, are beginning 
to be aware of the urgency of sustainability, of the consequences of climate change, uh, of the necessary energy transition, but they act as if uh, 2030, the, the date set for achieving the sustainable development goals, were still a long way off. They are very focused on digitalization and its technological impact in terms of efficiency in production processes, but perhaps pay little attention to the ethical and human dimension of this accelerated digital digitalization. In addition, there is a third key element in the transformation of our societies and economies, creativity, key to driving innovation. Sustainability, digitalization and creativity must go hand in hand in the development processes in a coherent and cohesive manner so that all people and all places have a real future. Then, how do we transform the new European Bauhaus from an initiative into a social movement that reinforces this idea? What role do we really want to play in defining how we want to live? How do we make spatial planning, urban planning, local development policies, economic promotion, innovation drive, cultural and creative policies, instruments to make this future for all people everywhere a real one? I hope we can bring some ideas to this debate today. Finally, I would like to thank the different organizations that are leading the, the different conversations, such as Creative Industries Cosiche today, the Basque government for its support in our task, and Tabacalera and Bilbao Metropolitan 30, represented here today by Idaia Postigo, who are the other Basque partners of the European Bauhaus and with whom we are collaborating in this dissemination. Thank you again. Um, very, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto, for your great words. And now we have a, in the program, we have a short round of uh, introductions. And if you want to share your screen with the inf introduction, just let us know. Or otherwise, we follow the order as I send it into the email. So the first to introduce, and it's my pleasure that she uh, agreed to, to take part in this conversation, is Joana Miranda from uh, Braga, Portugal. She's a new media strategist and training expert for creative media producer and educator currently working as executive coordinator of Braga Media Arts, UNESCO Creative City. So now. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, well, uh, I, I work in Braga. Uh, I work in the municipal cultural company um, of culture in Braga. Braga is a city in the north of Portugal. Uh, and uh, what we do in the company, the company is the, um, the main uh, axis of the cultural and creative dynamics of the city and the region. Uh, and, we, um, and we were responsible for developing the cultural strategy of Braga 2020-2030. Uh, which really identifies culture uh, as one of the pillars of our sustainable strategy uh, in the city. Uh, and to this end, uh, and follow up in that strategy, we, uh, we were acknowledged as a UNESCO Creative City uh, in the media arts. Uh, and we will we run the the, the program of, of 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 being part of, of that network, uh, and we are also uh, currently leading uh, Braga's application to be a European Capture of Culture in 2027. So what I I will speak to you uh, uh, as the mainly as within uh, from my experience of implementing uh, uh, the action program of Braga as an associative city in media arts. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. So we are in the same cluster. Yeah. Media art cities. Um, <clears throat> another guest, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Charles Landry, an author, speaker, and international advisor on future of cities best known for his concept and the book Creative City, a toolkit for urban innovators, which is in fact, it became a movement how to approach planning and development and management of a city. So welcome, Charles. Hi, everybody. 
Um, what can I say? I suppose in 30 seconds, I would say I'm obviously what do I do is obviously shaped by my background and my parents were immigrants. They escaped from the Nazis and all of that. And I was brought up in different countries, um, uh, Britain, Germany and Italy. So for me, culture then suddenly became a thing. And so my one slogan is culture is who I am or we are and creativity is what we could become because I always felt frustrated. So I'm not frustrated at the moment, I think, but <laughs> But uh, in terms of the work, that meant that I've always been thinking uh, for quite a long time about what are the resources, how, what's the intellectual architecture you use to understand places and so on. So initially it was thinking, oh, creativity wasn't taken more seriously. Then I've recently looked a lot at the psychological reasons why or how places work and so on and in terms of work um, I think the main thing at the moment that may be relevant is I for the last four years been organizing this uh, thing called the Creative Bureaucracy Festival and I know it sounds in crazy but the point is really saying that if you're looking at a city as an ecosystem it's not only the cultural creative sectors that are uh, imaginative. Everybody, in some sense, has to think, plan and act with imagination in looking at opportunities and solving problems. So I think that's enough for the moment. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And now I hand over to Gabu just to shortly present herself. She's an architect, urban planner and terrorist based in Vienna. Austria and she focuses on public spaces, collective housing and urban justice. So Gabu, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you both for inviting me here. Um, I understand this is not yet the content intro. It's only to say hello to everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I'm myself working as a practicing architect and um, urban planner and but I'm also an author um, and writer and I would say to not so much as extent as I would love it to be, but actually an activist as I'm really concerned with the housing crisis and uh, worldwide. Uh, and on the other hand, I'm based in Vienna, which of course is an interesting model when it comes to um, not only Bauhaus Gropius, um, uh, the time, but also of course uh, to really how to learn from Red Vienna, critically, honestly. So this is one of my major concerns and um, I hope to bring in some of my expertise in here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much. And now I hand over to Mathis Bounsen, who is an expert for large scale European cultural interventions and innovations. And uh, the key part of his work is accumulation of civic energy through engagement. So Mathis, it's your turn. Hello. Uh, hello everybody. Um, all over Europe, wherever you are. I'm really happy to be part of this, this group. Um, I was actually born in, uh, in the province of Limburg in the very south of the Netherlands. And I tell you this because the soil that I come from is very dense. It's the most dense type of clay that you can get. And that's why it's an area where the asparagus grow. So whenever you go there, um, grow, go and eat asparagus in where I come from. And I tell you this because it is it helps me to see other places in Europe where the sa this same type of clay is because it has some endurability, but it also helps me to, to see how sustainable ecosystems are and what we already have in the ground and what we can learn from that. And basically, this is what I used in working with more than like, for instance, more than 20 European cultural capitals in the last 15 years. Um, I work now uh, a lot in uh, Chemnitz, but also in Portugal and uh, in Dublin, not on a cultural capital, but it's on artist workspaces. Um, and I look forward to share my experience from that. But it always starts with basically engagement, asking what, what keeps people awake in the night, what makes them happy, and what says the place about them. These three questions are always central in my work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we go to Idoya Postigo, uh, Director General of Association Bilbao Metropoli 30. She's an, she has an extended experience 
in activities related to urban strategic thinking and management of large scale projects. Goya, it's your turn. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to, to take part in this, uh, in this meeting today, invited by Conexiones Improbables, our uh, colleagues, partners in the new European Bauhaus, and also very glad to know that they are also all friends in the group, like Charles and Vern taking part in, in this conversation. Uh, very briefly, um, I will present Bilbao Metropoli 30, which is a public-private partnership with nearly 140 members, representing, I would say, the, all the sec sectors of the metropolitan area of Bilbao, which is uh, the economic capital of the Basque Country on the north of Spain. And the, the role of BM30 is to foster a strategic vision for Metropolitan Bilbao, together with these uh, public and private members, not uh, from the executive responsibility, because Bilbao Metropoli 30 doesn't have any economic nor political power, but uh, from the uh, perspective of this neutral forum to foster uh, knowledge and sharing ideas and concepts to apply to the urban environment of our metropolis. And as I said, very glad to, to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. And now I hand over to Bernd Fessel, who is a director of European Creative Business Network, a senior advisor of European Center for Creative Economy, and a legacy person of uh, Ruhr 2010, European Capital of Culture. Uh, Bernd, it's your turn. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. I studied philosophy and economics, and this dualism of the material side and the immaterial side kind of, you know, uh, was the guideline for the rest of my working life. I have been an international art gallerist promoting um, artists uh, have been speaker of the Arts Council in Germany and then in 2003 started my first own company for the creative industries leading to the foundation of the German federal um, initiative for creative industries in 2008 and this was exactly kind of the initial birth with the economy of culture uh, you know the um, study we all know which key aided at that time uh, Barroso commissioned it and was kind of the kickoff to my European focus on the cultural creative industries. The last year I mainly focused on cross innovation, working to have a cluster for creative industries in Horizon Europe, which kind of worked as you know, and I have been now appointed to be part of the shadow committee for this cluster for the next seven years. Michael, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Bernd, and now I would like to introduce Milota Sidorova from Bratislava. She's a facilitator, moderator, and strategist, planner, networker, and feminist in service of more inclusive cities. Milota, it's your turn. Hello and good morning. Uh, I think you said it well, because if I had to summarize what I do, I would even use the term feminist, urbanist, and alter service of more equitable city. Uh, half of you know me, or I know half of you, so there is no need for this extensive CV. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some thoughts, not on directly European Bauhaus, but because I work somewhere between money, people, politics, media, I think we are living in very strange, uh, fluid uh, times where we really have to start not only first with projects, but actually who we are and where we are going. So I'm actually looking forward to hear, I suppose you are the best brains of Europe, uh, what you have to offer on this topic. So that's a uh, uh, good morning and looking forward to hear from you as well. Thank you very much, welcome. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to welcome Paul Owens, the co-founder of BOP and the internationally recognized expert on culture and the creative economy. And he's an, also a director of World Cities Culture Forum, working for Mayor of London. So, Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Mikhail. I know some of you, uh, but it's good to meet others of you. 
Um, if you're going to try to define where I come from, I would say I was uh, trained in the school of Charles Landry. Uh, the work of his company, Comedia, in the 70s and 80s had a huge influence on me personally, but also uh, still influences the work of uh, my company. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've been running on behalf of the Mayor of London, the World Cities Culture Forum. That's 40 cities. It's basically the deputy, deputy mayors and the culture directors of the city. So it's very kind of city hall view uh, uh, of cities, which is a good and a not, not so good thing. Um, and we're about two thirds of the cities are in Europe and North America and Asia. Uh, and we're trying to grow more engagement with uh, Latin America and Africa and Southeast Asia, which, as you all know, is actually where uh, 80, 90 percent of urbanization is going to occur in the next 50 years. Thank you very much. And the last but not least, Angela Palmitesa. And soon, Joao Nunes will join us as well. So, Angela, it's your turn. Hello. I found myself in a very nice space, but quite suggestive in the meaning of living at three times, as me lot to say, between borders. I'm in Malpensa airport waiting for Joao and any time sorry for any sounds. So I'm Angela Palmites. I'm an architect. I'm collaborating with uh, Nunes Gomez Studios since five years in the same school where I've been formed. And the school is Academia di Architettura in Mendrisio, Switzerland. Quite a new institution. We are now celebrating 25 years foundation. And um, it's a village in a valley on the axis uh, connecting the Mediterranean with uh, North Europe. And lo lo located as a geological condition is on the Insubric line, a huge edge where the African plate and the European plate collided. So it, it's funny, it's quite suggestive to me and actually remind me that I'm from the deep south of Italy, Joao is from Lisbon and we work together in Switzerland, in, which once again says more than words about how border is especially rich. Uh, Joao Nunes is a landscape architect, has a 40 years experience work as a firm and 60 years uh, uh, experience traveling world as uh, a man, a human. As a full professor in Medrisio Academy, he is part of the Newborn Landscape Institute uh, and is coming to join us. So we are really pleased to be part of today's dialogue. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we can see that we have a really, really great diversity of, uh, of speakers from landscape architects to metropoli and international advisors and people working in culture, people working for the municipalities. Uh, the second round is following the order of answering five questions uh, which Conexion has posted to all, all the parallel conversation groups. So we, we can follow the same order. And I just uh, say out loud for the audience the questions. So the first one is, what do you understand about the team Sustainable and Inclusive City? Uh, how can the new European Bauhaus have an impact on your field? So the field you're an expert in or you work. What role do you understand of cross-fertilization strategies play in your fields and for the Sustainable and Inclusive City as well? What specific role do you give to creative aspect in your field and new European Bauhaus? So what is the role of culture and creative industries within this framework? And then if you will, to share the three experiences, ideas which can contribute to sustainable and inclusive and beautiful Europe. So now there is a round of presentations we keep them hopefully uh, up to six to seven minutes each. If we go longer, never mind. But then after, after the round of presentation, we do a reflection and start a, start a dialogue where the most important things hopefully come up. So we, we follow the same order. So I would like to ask Joanna to share her screen or Begonia would share the screen for her. And I'm looking forward to her answers or statements. I was 
Obrigada, muchas gracias, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, well, uh, as I was, uh, well, I was saying you uh, um, a bit earlier, uh, I will speak you as sharing my experience as a coordinator of this uh, uh, action plan uh, as Braga as a creative city. Uh, city. Um, and from the experiencing, experience of thinking and implementing a program, uh, an actual program with actual activities um, and, and, and actual outputs that they have to fill in by, by the end. So uh, when Braga uh, joined the UNESCO Creative Cities Network in 2017, all of its program, all of it, and, I, and when I say all of it, it's all of its program was built around, uh, uh, built around setting out uh, and strengthening partnerships um, run policies, projects, and practices uh, that would uh, promote creativity uh, uh, and, and bolster, bolster participation uh, in cultural life. So we, are, we were really aiming to uh, working on integrating culture and the urban sustainable development plans that the city was, was, was uh, working on. So, um, so this is what I understand uh, and, and, and addressing the first question, uh, what it means for us uh, to work for a sustainable and inclusive city is working every day to make, to make this uh, 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 plan, this, this uh, connecting and, and setting out these partnerships, a real uh, and impactful reality. So uh, a second uh, slide, please. Um, and when in, in, in 2020, uh, the European Commission president called for a new bond between citizens of Europe uh, and actually uh, of the world around the Green Deal. Uh, and this uh, was in a wider uh, framework of the European recovery plan, uh, we, we, we have to remember, with that came, I think, one of the most urgent concerns of what it means to be uh, European. Um, this is how do we work together? Um, how do we find works, ways to work together? So uh, this new European Bauhaus um, is encouraging us um, to think out of the box uh, on finding ways to work together by consciously, uh, and I stress consciously, and actively uh, uh, evolve, you know, citizens, thinkers, students, architects, writers, poets, artists, uh, scientists, uh, designers, engineers, but, and I will, uh, but also policymakers, nation, national and regional and local authorities, uh, commons, uh, private organizations uh, uh, that are willing uh, to join hands uh, in finding solutions uh, for building what they, they uh, what we uh, set out to be uh, a greener, uh, a happy, uh, a beautiful, uh, a bold, a better Europe for all. Um, so, uh, working towards what Roberto was saying, making sure that no one, no one will be left behind and making these more than a beautiful, uh, but um, trying not to be a real, uh, irrelevant goal, because we are always repeating this and we cannot forget that is the aim of all of these programs that are, 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 are ahead of us. So uh, when uh, I think about how can the new European Bauhaus have an impact on my field, uh, on my field of work and, all, what, and uh, on, how, on what I'm, I'm supposed and I, I, I'm doing, uh, what I mostly hope is that this endeavor uh, this will actually inspire the doers that have real impact on our field to fully embrace this mindset. 
uh, that's what I hope we can uh, manage to do. So uh, 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 next slide, please. So um, what I think is these are very bold, are very complex, very uncertain, and sometimes very ambiguous goals. Um, but we have to embrace them exactly as they come with this, you know, not really getting a recipe to fall on, but to, to fall, but uh, uh, being brave enough to, uh, to focus on that and, and, and try to really implement this, this um, uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, mindset. So I actually believe, and I try to, to do it every day of my life, uh, that connecting uh, by creating and, and fostering uh, this cross-fertilization environment will actually contribute to, uh, to sharing uh, these challenges uh, and, and, um, and generate uh, synergies between all these so different actors in this immense territory. Uh, so, uh, and I think this will help us uh, to go a little further um, in, in, in sharing uh, uh, decisions that hopefully uh, will, 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 will lead us to uh, somehow a brighter future or, or at least a shared future. And this will happen, you know, locally from Braga or from, from Lisbon or from Kazice or from uh, Brussels, but and regionally and nationally and hopefully uh, in a European and more international level. So we have to work in all these, you know, um, uh, different uh, territories and different ecosystems that are not always aligned uh, and not always on the same mindset. So uh, when I think, slide please, when I think about a specific role for creative experts in my field of action and the new European Bauhaus, I cannot think of other than helping us finding the ways to uh, bring to light, as we already know that, that questions of technology, questions of built environment, product, material and service are not unrelated to those of culture, identity, governance, democracy, inclusion, but are rather, but are connected and interlinked and we already know it. So we have to make this, uh, you know, an evidence uh, 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 um, it's not the only way out, but one of our, our main way out of this uh, crisis, uh, let's not forget that we are all um, one more than others, of course, immersed in. So um, finally, most, and I, I was thinking about ideas, or actions I, I would share with you, but I cannot uh, uh, leave the, 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 this, 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 um, this idea, this uh, endeavor that I work all the time and we all the time and we in Braga do, at least our team does, that uh, most of our work uh, is demonstrating that, demonstrating by doing every day uh, that culture is an investment not the cost, you know, not, um, not something we put on, on our strategy plans to look good or a leisure or, I don't know, whatever. Uh, um, and we do it, and it's my, my most shareable experience that we do this by, uh, this work by joining forces day by day, uh, by building all of our programs together with partners from the city and try to get them on board, try to, you know, kind of make them understand, make them um, 
uh, make, uh, I don't know exactly what I, I would not be quite impulsive, but impositive, but trying to make them experience uh, that uh, together uh, we will become stronger. And, and we, do, we do this with partners from the city and the regional ecosystem. Uh, that are, you know, universities, schools, companies, you know, cultural institutions, international networks, national networks. Uh, we, you, you will, you know, what I'm talking about. So, from our training uh, and educational program that we invest a lot, that joins hard tech and science, uh, to our most experimental artistic uh, programs and biennales or to supporting artists and creative entrepreneurs uh, that are so resilient, so uh, innovative, to, you know, building a, a, a new media art center uh, in, in, in our um, historic uh, district. Braga is a 2000 year, uh, um, is a millionaire, uh, in, a millionaire city so we 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 we, we, we uh, fought to to make this uh, a real uh, an actual thing so we do this every day so uh, we are we have a lot of ideas a lot of experience but basically what we are you know what we can contribute is to make our work every day you know in the most um, uh, focus and and, and 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 impactful way. So, this is not a really task, as you know, uh, but is a resilient one for sure. And and that's what I would like to share to, with you. And and uh, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So the partnership and uncertainty and really doing doing day by day uh, is the most important thing to understand cultures and investment in our cities. So I'm really looking forward to what Charles thinks of those questions and how he's going to respond to them. Charles. Anyway, as I said earlier, it's great to be with this intimate group, a really lovely context. And so what I was really saying before is my thing, how does it relate to my theme? Really, how do you create a context, an ecosystem, whatever you want to call it, a setting, an intellectual environment and so on, where people, organisations and cities can think, plan and act with some sort of imagination in order to try to navigate the complexities that are, for example, the city. And the how the Bauhaus impacts on, on what I do or my field, if you want, I kept on obviously asking myself, you know, what was the essence of the Bauhaus and some of the things we all know, you know, there was a different kind of education focused on a different aesthetic, perhaps less formal, more interdisciplinary, an opportunity to think afresh. And I think all of those things, those qualities are ones we also need a um, hundred years later. In fact, in 2019, on the 100th anniversary, we did an event, which is why I'm so pleased you're doing this event, and we called it, What Would Bauhaus Be If We Reinvented It Today? And there were about 150 people there, and we had speakers who'd written the history of the Bauhaus, as well as people who were projecting forward. You can imagine what sort of people were speaking. And many of the things that were said are actually obvious. Obviously, the green agenda would have been completely embedded in everything they would have thought about. The other thing that came across as a strong theme was there'd be a completely different recognition of women and the other diversities. As you well know, in the traditional Bauhaus, and I'm simplifying, women were parked into the embroidery classes. I'm slightly exaggerating, but you, you, you know what I'm trying to get at. And the other things I think would be happening would be that one would have drawn on wider insights. I've mentioned already the psychological insight. How does a place feel? What is it experienced like? And so on. And one of the themes there was something I also wrote a small book about, which is the sensory landscape of cities. How looking at every sense you experience places and, you know, places as a totality. And... 
so one of the other things we did, which was perhaps our main thing, and this is a very horrible word we invented, I apologize, but we've got Bauhaus. We basically said from Bauhaus to place house. So what Bauhaus would have been interested in is the place, not the in individual building, let's say, only. It would be also the context, you know, the public space and everything around it. So that was the essence of, of, of what we did. And so in a sense that those were my or are my considerations on that. Now, in terms of the impact today, obviously, we know that creativity is context driven, you know, in the 19th century, it was about solving cholera. When our agendas, the people in this room came up, there was really this understanding of many of you in the room that there is this extra power somehow in culture, arts and all of these things. And that was all very important. And of course, now, it doesn't mean we delegitimize all those things. We then link them into the future domains within which we might need to be imaginative, inventive and creative and so on. Sometimes they're directly connected, all the work that people have done on spin-offs and spillovers of the creative and cultural sectors and so on. But also things that we need to think afresh, other forms of creativity that are coming from a different realm. Um, so what I think uh, the impact could be for me personally of the whole NEB initiative, it could be legitimizing this, let's think afresh, let's be bold. And as you know, the European Union is actually going about the process in a way that is far more open than any other of the initiatives so far before they decide to make decisions in September. So I would like that um, attitude that they've had in initiating this the EU ideally to be continued and to reinforce many of the things that you in this room and outside have been talking about but particularly reinforcing the importance of it to people who are not in this room those that are unconvinced those that who think that what we're talking about is a bit waffly and boring now, just something came into my mind as I was just talking and I was seeing all these Bilbao people in the room. <coughs> and I must just tell you something <coughs> that is completely irrelevant, but interesting for me. The first time I went to Bilbao was 1974. And I went past this factory and I thought, this is fantastic. It was in the evening, there was fire streaming out of it. It was a steel factory or something. And I thought, this is so beautiful. I was just sort of completely had this image in my mind. I just loved it. Then I read the Club of Rome report about sustainability. And then suddenly my mind shifted from what I thought was completely beautiful to completely ugly, because I had then seen that it was about, uh, you know, it was unsustainable and so on. Anyway, that's a parenthesis, irrelevant, but important to me, because what I'm hoping the Bauhaus does is it shifts the mindset, which in my sense, it shifted my mind to what I thought was beautiful and ugly. Now the question of what do I understand about cross fertilization, et cetera, et cetera. Now we all know, and all of you have been involved in this, in the long battle to break the silo. Now that does not mean that any of us think that someone with detailed, deep knowledge of a technical field is unimportant. No, it just means that there are other disciplines that are equally important. And one of them is the capacity to see the essence of other disciplines as well and their importance in an integrated way. Now, if we're talking about place and space and cities, we of course need to know the essence of the environmental questions. It doesn't need, mean I need to be an environmentalist, I want them. But I also want that environmentalist to understand the essence of how do you create sociability in place. I want the accountant, of course we need to know what that one and one equals two, but I want the accountant also to understand that the emotional life of a city is also there and that you can't perhaps quantify it. As you well know, and I'm not gonna say much about this, obviously some things can't be measured in simplistic ways. So anyway, 
The thing about breaking the silo is key, particularly since we all know that everything is inextricably interwoven, wicked problems and so on. And the important thing about that is that that has an effect on the organizational management and governing systems that need to match those complicated uh, uh, I I I environments. And so what it means is creating more context when we work not in multidisciplinary ways where the expert in environment and culture and economics or whatever stands there and says, these are my rules and this is what I think is important. It's more in the transdisciplinary way where you say, what is our vision? What do we want to achieve? Let's say a great street. What are the qualities of that? And what is your contribution to help make that street great, rather than you telling me what your codes and standards and all of that is? And that is a really important shift to make, because what that, that then does, it shifts things to what is the vision and these are the rules, the negative version, but what is the vision and what are the rules we need to create to help that vision be en enabled? Now, uh, your first or fourth question is the creative aspects in your field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think I've implied everything here, which is really developing a culture of openness, experimentation, 360 degree thinking, bringing different teams together, collaboration, all of that. We all know it's very easy to say, difficult to do, because in real collaborations of different interest groups, some lose and some gain. And that's rarely said. We often just say, oh, let's all collaborate oh, if it's, as if it's a cosy thing. It is often quite difficult. Three experiences. I can think of one, which is a mood, a second, which is a practical idea, and a third, which is an event. The mood is perhaps, and, 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 and Bernd obviously knows about this because we're collaborating on this, is I think there is a move that there could be a new rebirth, a renaissance, whatever you're talking about. And we've discussed this over several months now. And that there might be new principles to guide us. And that could be a compelling story. You know, there are eco principles, the green transition, circular economy, new concepts of co-creation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then the digitizing world that runs like electricity through the whole system that, that we're involved in. Anyway, together, all of that is potentially transformative. So I think there's a mood, and that's one thing that I think is really important. And taking a helicopter view, I think one can feel that mood if one takes the glass half full approach. The second one is the practical idea, which relates to mood, which is you can see how uh, the idea of the 15 minute, the 10 minute, the one minute city has taken hold like wildfire. Now, many of you have been arguing about these things, the city of proximity, of density and all of these for years. But suddenly, because there's a mood and perhaps the pandemic helped, we all suddenly think it's obvious. This is what we should be doing. Yes, of course. Yeah, let's follow Paris. Yeah, let's do all that. Great. I think it's fantastic. Um, and lastly, the event, my minuscule butterfly contribution is m my own little festival thing. And the only thing to say there, it's trying to say, how can we harness the collective intelligence of also that grouping called public administrators who have a lot to offer? if the conditions are right, and to connect them to the civic worlds, the business worlds, and these other worlds that all of us and you represent. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, and now I would like to ask Gabu to do a short uh, intervention in this. Gabu, you would like to share a few slides here, obviously. Yes. <clears throat> Do you have the image full screen? Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Well, do you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I want to actually take what the Gropius um, series by being a socialist, um, uh, well, that he was one, um, and also to read his texts. And I read, um, not just before this um, uh, meeting, but I've read texts of his, and I wanted to quote this one moment, saying um, it's from Housing Industry, 1924. Housing the people is a problem of mass requirements. Who would dream of having his shoes custom made? 
Instead, we buy stock products which satisfy most individual requirements thanks to refined production methods. Similarly, it will be possible for the individual in the future to order from stock dwellings suitable for his purposes. And he actually continues uh, with going on in the kind of um, the technology of mass production of housing. And I believe he, he would today actually continue to rethink possibly to compare housing with shoes. Why am I saying this? Um, this is an image of um, central Vienna, the most, um, you know, like one of a celebrated uh, very cultural um, centers of Europe. Um, and I'm happy to read this as it's very small. It says, you don't have to live in these apartments to love Vienna, owning them will do. So basically here we're in the center of um, a housing becoming a financial asset, um, um, concrete gold as it's called, etc. And uh, as we were asked to, okay, what would create an intellectual environment um, um, suitable for, for all people to be included, etc. It would certainly be the right to housing, maybe the right to, to find housing rather than actually the right to just own it. And um, this facade inscription, I would actually um, oppose with one that you can find uh, in many more places in Vienna also today, which is basically the inscriptions that um, historic Red Vienna, this is um, uh, kind of the time of, uh, between 1919 and 1934 in Vienna, um, or we should say 1933, um, when a lot of like the over 64,000 um, uh, workers housing units were built in Vienna and all of these houses still have these inscriptions today. The housing tax was an extremely progressive tax that actually um, translated uh, redistributed from those who had lots to those who had little. Um, so um, uh, this housing tax, uh, could we imagine today any government that would actually A, invent the tax and then put it proudly onto houses. So this is what actually made us um, do some collages, imagining a future, and I guess this would be where I would see kind of um, maybe Bauhaus or Umbauhaus um, uh, or like a, a new Bauhaus in terms of um, really bringing these issues, bringing the social and the ecological and the technological and economic issues together. So this could be a facade inscription saying it's a city house. Maybe it's not any built anymore by the city of Vienna or any other city, but maybe it's made possible in the future years. And then we could discuss what sort of taxes should that be? Should that be an inheritance tax, a CO2 tax, a, um, and, and, and. Or we could also discuss, uh, which is like a collage we did for Berlin, and it says, um, it's in German here, it says reappropriated, or actually, um, um, so we could actually talk about um, uh, Deutsche Wohnen AG, and maybe it's also like uh, made green by the city of Berlin in this sense, is, um, in, in this sense of like um, some, some taxing the rich in the future. So why am I saying this? Um, I believe that um, this is one of our key issues um, uh, to, to think um, intellectual environments <laughs> based on like existential security and existential safety, which relates a lot to housing. Um, and I want to give you three, these three moments that I was asked um, to look at. Um, this is um, a collage of the house that we supported as architects in Vienna. It's a, it's a house that a group of um, people who experience diverse uh, number of uh, margin, uh, marginalizations, precarity. It's uh, people who have papers, who have no papers, um, who are in wheelchairs, who have uh, speak different languages, uh, who walk, who, who wheel, who, who are in Petra constellations, have different sexuality and so on. They all kind of collectively um, rented this house and built themselves a whole large um, community having hardly any money themselves. But this was the moment that I would uh, recall forever. I, I watched a moment, half an hour, where they actually celebrated, the, well not celebrated, they organized the solidarity economy by discussing who could give how much independent of uh, how much space they actually will be living in in this house. Like a um, person in the wheelchair will have much more space uh, or need much more space than 
than uh, somebody else. Um, family needs more, but not all of them can pay the same. So not paying parameter, but what you can do. Another moment is um, also a project um, uh, that we are supporting. Um, uh, it's called Schlor, and it's actually rebuilding an industrial complex, um, keeping as much as possible and recreating um, a kind of a creative center in a very industrial, um, not very creative um, area of the city of Vienna. And aside from that, what it does, it actually um, starts to develop um, an, a syndicate structure called Habitat, very similar to the Mietshäuser syndicate in Germany, which actually effectively buys buildings and ground all out of the capital market and at once kind of uh, collectivizes it by, by, um, by linking it into this um, syndicate structure and uh, supporting each other for it not ever to be part of speculation again. I'm being very brief, we can have a lot of discussion about this later. And um, because public space has been so important, um, um, I, you, I, we could call many, this is a moment where um, a group of uh, protesters actually protested um, to have this um, green field um, being taken over by yet another uh, gastronomy, like yet another uh, large scale restaurant. I think there's a lot of, um, what we need to actually discuss also in terms of land grabbing when it comes to um, public land. And um, this is, I would say, I like this collage very much. It's uh, done by a new left uh, party in, in Vienna. And this is where I come back to, to Gropius and uh, taking him serious in, with, with, with his socialist concerns and uh, the idea of uh, re redistribution. This was a comment on at the moment when Moria was burning and um, the refugee center um, was relocated in Lesbos uh, uh, and the cities of uh, Europe were actually asking themselves, could they welcome or actually uh, support refugees uh, within their own cities? Vienna did also not take any. And uh, it says here, there is place for 380 of them. And it did this all around Vienna where a lot of um, vacancy, but also um, speculation was taking place while there could be enough space for everybody. And that's what I understand an inclusive city. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very important point. And now I would like to ask Matis to come up with his reflection on propius and questions. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, okay. Um, hello, my name is Matthijs Mausen. I, um, I live in Prague, um, but um, in the last uh, 20 years or so, I, um, I worked in different places in Europe and um, yes, many of them basically um, related to, to, to projects where you, where you all are, um, um, yeah, where, where you all are based, like Baraga in, in San Sebastian, in um, uh, Kosice, uh, also in Austria, I worked recently in St. Pulten, and now I work in Chemnitz a lot. Um, so this is my the context where I work. Um, I like to think, um, I like to thank uh, Charles for his uh, appeal to, to think fresh because actually that's where I, I would like to start. Because when I, yesterday, when I was thinking about uh, where to start, I thought about Gropius and I thought like, what, what context was Gropius actually thinking about? You know, what was the, what, what was the, the urban planning when he started? You know, but what, what, where did, where, what was the context where he, he was aiming at? And actually I found a, an interesting thing because uh, what I found is that uh, he basically was living in a context where the first uh, international urban conference in New York took place in, 80, in, 89, in 1889. And actually it was um, one of the biggest problems that they were there discussing was the, the, the manure that was foreseen for all the horses that was living in the different cities. And actually predictions were seen, uh, yeah, the Times was writing about it. Um, 
a big problem was not only the manure, but also, uh, yes, the, the, the urine, uh, the, the, the context, you know, really dense base of, of, of problems. And um, actually it went this far, far that in that time, um, um, actually there's one of the stories is, is that in that time also the zebra was uh, invented because that was the place that, that people were keeping clean in stepping stones in order, so it was not so much protection from the, uh, from the, uh, from the traffic, but it was more places where you could step that are clean to cross the road. And the people that were cleaning it were asking, people that were making use of the zebra were actually stepping over this, uh, this kind of things. Why do I tell about this is that, um, yeah, for me, what is interesting in, in this case is that uh, um, the predictions were terrible. Everything was going to be uh, one big doom scenario. And at the end of the day, um, yeah, a trust in the ecosystem was set up and uh, the industrial revolution actually led to another polluter. But uh, at least uh, 10 to 15 years ago, many of the cars started being replaced by it. Many of the horses started to being replaced by by cars and the, 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 the conception of the problem at least shifted in another way. And it came by practical solutions, by people that start doing things. And I think that is something that I find a lot in my work. Um, the people are not necessarily um, so much, their identity is not so much what they think they are or what they say, but what they do in, in, in their activities. And in that doing, that's, that's the way of how I, I like to work uh, in, in the cities that I work with. And in many cases, this, is, um, this has to do, for instance, with large cultural uh, interventions like a European cultural capital, where cities start asking around uh, what, what should be the theme. And um, my experience, uh, what, what in my experience works really well is something that I call a process of um, 10,000 cups of tea. And what does it mean? Like in the city of Dublin, we went to the streets and we asked the three central questions. What keeps you awake in the night? What makes you happy? And what says this place about you? And with that question asked in 10,000 cups of tea questions, tea and chat type of questions, open questions that was asked, people started sharing what was their, uh, yes, what was their urgencies? And so not only the trees and the, the, the trees hanging over and the, and the dogs leaving things behind, but also the deeper issues that people were, um, were that were mattering to people. And in these kind of large scale engagement processes, basically I've learned um, a couple of things that I would like to share here with you is that, that in these processes, I find that that antennas that is set up there is is basically um, um, yes is as I as I stipulated it here down uh, in in this text. It is this this everything is possible in a digital way, which is actually the structurelessness of that basically, and and also the fear that comes along with it of not being able to understand anymore because there's so much information going on if you don't address that and start stimulating processes with this from the beginning you get into trouble um, other messages is is this really big top-down messages like one message for all and and not respecting that there's many different publics and uh, recently i ended up in a conversation about what is a maker in europe and uh, yeah, to my uh, experience, there is maybe 50 different kinds of makers. And what makers don't like is to call, be called a maker and then be associated with another tribe that they, that they totally don't relate to if they don't understand where it comes from. So this combining of, 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 of publics is, I see, is, is a, a big issue. And one way communication, the, the do it all yourself, that's basically isolates, so not depending on the on the giants and build processes around that, especially also in the software, um, in, in the software and in, and in the digital platforms. Um, this top down and master planning, it, it, it becomes more and more critical. It is not about what knowing what people want, but 
It is asking for and supporting what people need and, and, and put that in a, in a self-disciplined and self-efficient context. That, that's where I see uh, projects growing. Um, I also see it growing in, 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 in a welcoming and constant cultivation of, of communities, especially digitally. It's not, it's not only just setting up a network and then hope that it works from, from itself. It only works when you work it. And, and it only works when you work it on a daily basis, one day at a time. Um, where I think uh, a big aspect is, is as well is, is learning to, to, to speak the participative language and take, take that in different kind of multiple tools next to each other. Um, the, the last term that I want to discuss on this is this, this principle of nesting. So it's not mining, but nesting. So it's this constantly coming and, and as a project or as a process coming and, and, and trying to, to intervene with the idea. Also, everybody knows that it goes away again. Um, in, that, in that process, a lot of damage is also many times done. So, so um, really nesting a, pro a process like a large scale European intervention like cultural capital could be, is, is, is really build it with a plan B upfront. What, what are you gonna do when it doesn't work? And, and that makes you actually more clear about where you really want to go. That kind of focus is really needed. And there you attract people instead of promoting and pushing, but you attract people around the, the core focus. And in that focus, that's where the strength is. Some examples, this is an example uh, from Conexiones e Probiables. In San Sebastian, you know, so if you start doing these 10,000 cups of tea in San Sebastian, it was called in a different context, but here a young boy at a school that is standing there in the middle said, puppy, I or Mr. Teacher, I want to do something with plastic on the beach. What happened here is that uh, an artist basically said, okay, let's start collecting it on the beach and start, let's start organizing theater at the beach. What happened here is that the, the students collected plastic they made huge letters. It was uh, photographed with a drone. Other schools started doing it. And in the end, a whole new organization was set up that was basically together with surf riders and other organizations was actually started collecting plastic all over the Atlantic coast. Another example here from, from, from my practice, it's not me who came up with these ideas. It is always the processes that I'm involved in. Oh, something goes wrong. The process that I'm, I'm involved in, but um, ideas that you see here is, for instance, a rooftop festival in Nicosia that is basically looking over the borders and that is basically signalizing at both sides of the borders um, around diversity and, and biology and, and uh, biodiversity. They are signalizing to each other, but at the same time, these rooftop festivals are basically also talking over the border, the, the, the Russia, the, the, the Turkish and the, and the Cypriot border. Another example is a potato festival. That's something that I see growing. That's why I started also talking about asparagus in the beginning. Uh, these, these festivals around a real product. And then in this case, it was a, uh, a festival uh, with, with farmers in Friesland that then made a connection with Malta, but it, because it appears that most of the potatoes in, eaten in the Netherlands come from Malta. And so uh, an exchange came, came to, and, and, and so the potato festival got uh, a delivery also in Malta with, uh, with ag agricultural people there. And then not only cultural aspects were exchanged, but really also practical, uh, practical tools and how to deal with the market. Another, another example is, for instance, a poetry festival about diversity in a place that doesn't have a lot of a diversity, uh, a snack bar where there's maybe a cart with like 10 things to eat, but then uh, you start talking at places like this with a real, with a real creative uh, diversity in mind. Um, an, an open air festival in the landscape, which is basically um, a, a, a tourniquet, you have a, a coffee bar, you have a parking, you have everything, but for all the rest, it is just the landscape. So you basically walk around the landscape and actively see what is going on. Uh, another example is, for instance, in a city like, like Siena, a, a city where that, that is actually 
completely overpacked with tourism. Yeah, 50,000 people receive 18 million visitors every year. And uh, to organize in a, in, a, in a city like that, a museum of, of tourism and, and sustainable tourism to start thinking about these kind of things and also see how much interest that gets. That's really interesting. Um, there's also really big scale. So like the, if you look at the uh, Leeward and cultural capital, basically it was really bottom up built up. And actually from that, the, the main idea grew and the main idea was to, to set up a whole cultural capital uh, project, uh, 50 million euro around the principle, um, how biodiversity influences cultural diversity. And this is something that is written in the in the in 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 UNESCO uh, the, um, the definition of culture and that definition of culture was really experimented with a 50 million euro program. It didn't work everywhere, but in many cases, uh, people were surprised how much how, how big that real influence is if you start working with creative people. And this brings me to the last example is is in also in Freestone, but there's other examples in other countries. Is that in Freestone? One of the things that happened was that uh, uh, a professor came to one of these workshops and basically said there is a big problem because a certain type of bird needs to go, um, is always going to Africa to, to stay in the winter, but because the farmers are using a different type of grass, this bird is flying earlier from the Netherlands and from the north of, of Europe to Africa, and now it comes at the time that the seeds are put in the ground in Africa, big problem. How do we deal with that? And so what they started doing is they started actually connecting the different places where the bird is flying from Friesland over Flanders to the south of, of France, to the middle of, of Spain, to the south of, of Portugal, and then making the crossing. So it started making a connection between these different places where the bird lands and stays for a while, and found different kinds of connections. And one of the first things that happened here was that uh, two researchers from these similar regions fell in love and, and, and made, and that's why I put this photo also, fell in love and actually uh, created a family. But over this, uh, a whole process of understanding how uh, the use of certain types of grass in Friesland is influencing cultural climate change problems in, in, in Africa, led to a whole new wave of um, basically communication and cultural interventions that in, in this case was also shown, but this is a project that actually really a whole organization stepped out of this. Okay. Um, um, what I share with the commissioner as a last thing is our love for asparagus because we come from the same city of Heerlen in the Netherlands. And so I really hope that if you ever read a report about this, at least this sentence is mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I would like to hand over to Idoya and I would like to ask our speakers just to keep sharp on time because then we don't have uh, enough time for a discussion at the end. And Idoya, it's your turn. Uh, yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, well, um, I have decided to change a little bit the order of the questions you, you, you proposed and starting on how the new European Bauhaus can have an impact on, on our field. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, our organization, Bilbao Metropoli 30, works uh, mainly on the strategy and on the long-term uh, future perspective for, for our for Metropolitan Bilbao. Uh, we believe that one of the reasons why we've been selected as partners of this project is because the new European Bauhaus is in fact a project based on concepts, ideas, uh, towards which type of future do we want for Europe. In the end, what is under uh, the principles of the new European Bauhaus is 
uh, which type of European cities we do we want to build for the future. So um, the, we share this perspective with, uh, with the project and we think that uh, it has been the main reason perhaps for our being elected for, for the project. Um, regarding uh, the, the, the concept of sustainable and inclusive city, in order to describe what it means for BM30, I have taken some of the main lines that have been included in the uh, strategic reflection that we launched with our members uh, in 2016. Uh, as I said before, our main aim is to foster this type of neutral forum in which uh, our partners can discuss and we can, in the field, promote this public-private private partnership and cooperation in defining uh, the main lines for our future. So in this strategic reflection, uh, there are several lines. I have just selected four that, in my opinion, could be those that best describe the, the principles of the new European Bauhaus. Uh, one of them is related to the physical environment. And I think, um, as a consequence of the pandemic, there were voices in the beginning that were questioning uh, density against health. And uh, there is a concept that uh, Gabu thinks, I think she has mentioned existential, existential safety. I like a lot uh, the, the, the concept because it, it addresses uh, this, this dilemma um, and I think that with the months after this pandemic, and now that hopefully we are finishing this this um, this very dark uh, era of, of uh, our lives, uh, we've seen that that the di dilemma, in fact, has disappeared because um, it, it questions, in fact, the reason why cities exist. Uh, we have created human beings have created cities to. Uh, give an answer to our primary needs in a sustainable way and also to give an answer to the social needs of human beings. And those needs uh, haven't disappeared with the pandemic. So it means that we still need compact urban spaces to give answer to these uh, human needs. So that would be the first principle of what we understand by sustainable and inclusive city. Secondly, um, we need a new economic models. It's been obvious that um, we have arrived to this point in which uh, we don't need just to include uh, cohesion or equality in the narrative like a superficial statement. We need principles and clear bets uh, about cohesion and inclusion in our cities, uh, not from a palliative way and addressed to a specific groups of, of the population, but as, as I said, as a clear principle of, of uh, living together, okay, of what uh, living in a city mean. Uh, thirdly, we also need uh, participatory governance mechanisms. Um, all the decisions that we take uh, about the urban uh, environment affect not only our the way uh, we build the city in 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 terms of infrastructures, but also in the way we live, and we have to make all the people citizenship. In fact, should be responsible and protagonist of this decision making process, right? And thirdly, we need to include the sense of belonging and identity uh, uh, linked to the city. Um, Charles has written a book about the nomadic world in which he mentions that before the pandemic, we moved perhaps more than ever in history. But it's true that the identity sense of the people is still um, is very linked to the uh, urban space in which we live and work. So we need to recover this part of our identity um, linked to, to the way the, the place in which we the, to the way uh, to the place in which we belong, right? Um, regarding cross fertilization strategies, well, there is a this is a, um, 
a sample of the working groups that BM30 promotes in order to carry out this uh, aim that I mentioned, this uh, strategic reflection process. But I think that the new European Bauhaus project itself uh, could be considered like a test for, the, for Europe in these cross-fertilization processes, because it's true that um, from my perspective, it's quite unusual, this way of building the project bottom up uh, to the way we are used to deal with the European Union projects, right? So I think they are testing how um, the involvement of partners could um, give an answer to the needs that they are uh, putting on the table, right? So I think that could be um, a good way of considering the new European Bauhaus like a prototype um, scheme for, for how Euro Europe in, in, in the whole can work in, in, in this type of cooperation, right? Um, Regarding the role of creativity in the new European Bauhaus, well, I think uh, Charles again could be, and lots, lots of you could be perhaps uh, um, more appropriate to answer this question. Um, I think that the, we need to include creativity in uh, giving an answer to, to the challenges that the new European Bauhaus is proposing us. First, because we are not talking about just um, uh, partial problems. We are dealing with uh, multi-sectoral problems that affect not only different aspects of the life of our cities, but also different agents. So um, we need creativity to deal with all these uh, interests that are on the table. Uh, secondly, the problems we are addressing are not uh, limited to any geographical limits. Uh, it's very difficult to deal with sustainability just in one municipality without taking uh, into account what the other municipalities or even our metropolis or our um, influence area is doing in that field. So we need geographical interconnection in dealing with uh, the problems and the principles of the new European Bauhaus. And thirdly, I think we need uh, to get new opportunities in this project. Uh, linear thinking perhaps will be too narrow to give an answer to these challenges and it will be more difficult to get opportunities if we are thinking about the future like a copy more or less similar to the present. We need uh, creativity and uh, disruptive thinking to get um, the opportunities that underline um, in this project, right? And finally, regarding experiences on Metropolitan Bilbao that could be um, connected to the uh, principles of the, of the new European Bauhaus. Uh, first, I would mention the Zorro Zaurre Island, which is perhaps the most, the biggest, a urban area that we have available for transformation in Metropolitan Bilbao. I imagine you all know that we were, we used to be a very industrial era, very wealthy, but based on, on a steep, uh, steel industry and shipbuilding, those industries disappeared and collapsed in the 70s and 80s. And, and we still have um, spaces by the river that goes from the sea to the city center of Bilbao to recover. Zorrozaure is perhaps the best example uh, for Bilbao and the metropolis to, to recover this industrial um, heritage and transform this area with the paradigm of, of the new European Bauhaus project. Uh, so we are, we have organized a conversation in which uh, Conexiones has also taken part in which, in which we are trying to include the principles of the, of sustainability, inclusive art and design in the island. Secondly, there is an example of another village belonging to the metropolitan area, which is Baracaldo. Uh, this is the Munoa Villa and Estate, with, which used to be, uh, excluded to the uh, citizenship use 
and now this it's been recovered and uh, to the enjoyment of citizenship and this is one of the initiatives that that bm30 has presented to the new european bauhaus projects and the third example would be our cooperation with the bus government in the urban agenda project uh, bringing the new European Bauhaus projects to the scale of the neighborhood. Uh, we are now working on, on, on this perspective and that will be the third experience I would like to, to share with, with you. And um, that's all from my part. Very glad to take part in this conversation and I'm ready to answer any question you have for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Idoya. And now I would like to ask Bernd to make his presentation. Thank you, Michael, again for having me and inviting me. Um, thanks for all my colleagues here. It was fantastic listening and uh, learning. And from Gabu, I learned now that I'm at least a hidden socialist. Maybe I'm also an obvious one. We will see after this presentation. Uh, so for me, most important is that this new European Bauhaus is more than just a trend. Uh, we know that usually European projects and fundings are over two or three years um, and rarely uh, beyond seven years because this is the funding period. Um, and here it's really of relevance that this is understood as a project of a decade as it has been uh, with the old Bauhaus and what um, Charles also framed this emerging of the parallel uh, crisis and rebirth we are seeing now is really reminding us of a kind of a new renaissance being born. And in this, the European Bauhaus is part and parcel as well. So you asked me about the understanding I have here. And I try to you know, pinpoint a few things to get our debate moving. I think my understanding here in the field of sustainable uh, cities is really to introduce impact investment instead of the commercial commercialization of public goods. That would be a vast transformation and is in line with many aspects uh, speakers have said here already. This is more the general phrase framing this if it's from place making to other things. I think it's also about uh, making cultures and people's value uh, the new mainstream and city mating, not the usual smart city focused on tech, not only the branding city, which we see with the UNESCO Creative City Project and others, it must be more than those uh, trends of the past. What is a possible impact of the new European Bauhaus? Uh, I have here in a nutshell what other speakers have said already, it's about a new role of city planners. To me, it's about ending the silo and sole ruling of city planning by city planners. And uh, that's also part of the cross-fertilization. Um, others have coined it as, uh, you know, involvement of citizen, citizen participation. But if you coin it the other way around, it's ending this kind of silo. And I know this is also about a large mind shift in city planners, but you have universities teaching this already. So this um, possible impact is not without hope. Um, I think it's about reinventing construction and innovating architecture for the 95% of our society. Um, Gabu said this already, that um, the European Bauhaus was about mass construction, construction for the masses, and of course, we see the skyscrapers, we see the investment buildings of banks and insurance companies with the latest tech and latest innovations. But 95% of the usual citizen still live in buildings which are built and constructed uh, as it has been some 50 years ago. So I think um, this is uh, underway already because uh, we see an innovation in construction because of uh, the carbon footprint. We will see uh, that construction methods are overhauled. Maybe 3D printing or cradle to cradle houses are underway. And I think we should use this innovation in the technological part of construction to also have a social innovation. So uh, to enable people to live better than before in the standard housing. 
Last but not least, it boils down to redesigning property markets and private investment schemes. Um, this is not part of the European Bauhaus yet, but you see here that I'm looking into a holistic uh, approach of the new European Bauhaus impacts about technological, social, and also the regulatory, the legal, the property investments in the city. I think in the end, we have to accept that it all comes together. If you're thinking of cradle to cradle houses, we take down the houses on the spot and rebuild it. What does it mean for reselling houses, for buying it and selling it when it has a higher value? Will this be the future of property markets? I think those wider framing questions need to be addressed. And please be patient with me if I'm posting questions here, which are so big, where we don't hardly know a question, but just as Sarah said, it's about thinking fresh, that it also means uh, asking impossible questions. <laughs> so what about um, cross-fertilization? First of all, I think it's in policymaking. Policymakers need also to work um, cross-minister, cross-administration more together. Second, it's in the field of architecture, cross-fertilization. Um, as this sector is now so imminent for the new European Bauhaus, I also hope that this old tradition of the architect being the central artist of everything, you know, at former times, architects were designing the toilets, the, the chairs, and um, even the, um, you know, the flowers, everything was designed, not just the building. So I think this needs to be revitalized, but not only in a technological sense, but also in a social sense, looking into uh, the multiplicity of architects. We have vast migrants, cultures living in our cities and other architects uh, might fit them much better than what we know now. Last but not least, I think uh, cross-fertilization needs to go into the public agora this has been said here already, but I want to point also into social media. What we are thinking here of revitalizing a new city uh, must be also reflected in our public debate. And I don't think our public debate structures are fit to do so now. And this comes to the third question, the creative aspects. So the inclusive city we are talking about needs to be iterative. It needs to be open in cycles, we need to be able to be a learning city. This has been said here with an other speaker as well. I think Doria said it. Um, so I think design thinking methods has, have to be applied. Um, I think one of the creative aspects and value edits we can bring in is to think um, in the field of sustainability out of the box. A lot of things in the terms of um, new value chains have to be reinvented. You know, the whole topic of, um, for example, the um, circular economy is about reinventing use. Just think of parking houses, you know, uh, at day they are full, at night they are totally empty. This is unused space. So why do people which are without a living home, which are homeless, have to sleep on the streets. Why are they not sleeping in the parking places and the parking houses being empty? So this is a model of circular economy. No euro needs to be invested. It just needs to be reimagined on a large scale, really think out of the box. And I know it's daring to say, a day you're parking your Porsche, at night a poor fellow is sleeping there who's homeless. But that's exactly the way of cross-fertilization we can make with radical creativity. And this relates to the last topic, the circular economy, really look into interface design, open innovation, involve the users of the city on a really broad scale, and not only um, yeah, the, the top 5% of the city, that won't work. You asked me for three experiences. Uh, coming back to cross-fertilization, one of the great experiences I had goes back to the European Parliament, where uh, one member, two members of Parliament initiated um, an intergroup for culture creative industries. This was not only good for the creative industries, but also a great parliamentarian lecture and learning what happens if the silo parliament committees collaborate and work together in an intergroup. 
And I think this uh, is a learning for local parliaments as well. If the cultural uh, committee, the uh, business committee and the planning committee work together. And I can tell you from my hands-on experience, I'm a member of a city council, I am in a cultural committee, how silo this really is. So this is my first experience, bring cross-fertilization into local parliaments. Um, I learned from the cultural capital that change making is something you have to practice, you have to learn. Um, when we are educated, we are educated to, to live in a stable environment. We are not educated to have change all the time and to have change of large complex systems like a city, like a whole economy, value chains, not just one, but 50. Um, this needs to be learned and changed. And um, I learned at the cultural capital in the Ruhr in 2010 that intervention of the creative industries can not only drive the creative industries, can not only drive urban quarters and city development, but is really a lecture in change making. So see this interventions, especially temporary interventions as a change maker in general for this kind of new inclusive city we are looking to. And last but not least, my experience relates uh, to the topic of the social and the media space. I have talked um, about this cross-fertilization into the public agora. And if you are a public person, and if you are like me, moderating, for example, here in my hometown, a social media group of 2000 people, you are immediately contacted with hate speech. And uh, this is a great threat to inclusion. It's a great threat for, for women, for minorities, for many not to speak up and not to say their opinion because they are afraid that somebody will hate them in the internet and then a few days later will do that uh, in school and even in their own, own street. So we need safe and trusted spaces, especially in social media. That's my experience I want to, to bring in here. And you see again, I picked experiences from very different areas from policy, from interventions and from media and public space to show this is really a holistic endeavor. And that's my final word as a compliment for this in invitation here. Uh, I'm kind of the odd one out here with this kind of framing advocacy and policy making. I really love that we are here in this group and this invitation, also such a diverse holistic group. So my congratulations to this invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would hand over to Milota. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. That's great. Uh, so I got this uh, uh, question, like what would groupies do and, and things like that. And my immediate uh, answer was like, I think he would be a woman today and he would be working collectively. And that is where it ended. Uh, that's how thinking. I'm going to tell you uh, about some thoughts uh, because maybe like me, you are all international European thinkers and we understand our language. It's barely vague and we, we agree, but then you are faced forced to live in your own country during pandemics and the speech is different, right? So I'm going to go back to Slovakia and bring you something maybe you can digest for European Bauhaus. So I'll just start with that. We cannot separate people from environment. And I, that's why I will not talk about architecture and design and environment at first. I will also put aside those terms sustainability or inclusivity because they are really, really vague and uh, intellectual to me. And nobody in my environment really understands them. But before we go on uh, and think for the future, I want to make this reflection because the pandemic really is more important than we, we think. Uh, we don't know all the side effects, and I don't mean just economically, but psychological on people. And during this time, we all suffer, yes. And many of us lost a job or like relationships or even our beloved, and these are really huge life events. And it wasn't a good time for any of us, but we are still here, yes, even today. And we are now maybe looking forward for opening world to, to come on. But in a, in a some bizarre sense, this pandemic was a uniting element, like this uh, huge experience of collective suffering. I understand all of you and anyone in, in Europe because we did the same thing. And I think it's an opportunity how to uh, enlarge the emphasis or like 
empathy for, for the people and humanity. So I don't want to separate people from the environment because it is us who are shaping it in short term. So let's ask ourselves this basic question. How are we today? How do we feel about everything, you know? Are we still a little bit overstressed or are we full of hate or, or fear for the future? Maybe we are a little bit greedy. We don't trust the government and we have anxieties. Can we really work these feelings out before we wake up in the morning and do our jobs as professionals and part of the society? Don't we have really the, the fear from the future that it won't be as good for us and our children as may, maybe for the past generation? And let me be clear on this. I will not be overly optimistic. Uh, the, the future seems at its best, really complicated task in which we will not have the liberties and benefits from old eras, in our time communism, even on, on, on the value of totality, uh, totality, but we still had these resources, nobody cared for the future. That won't happen. And uh, we will be under constant stress uh, of our like democracy, individual freedoms. This will take uh, energies of all of us to protect this. Uh, social inequalities will grow no matter what. This is global trend and uh, the environment will change. So let there be no illusions. We will not maintain current status quo. But in order to live and wake up every day in the morning to have some purpose in this world, I think we need to accept this future and accept those, this fear before because I feel it around me in these ordinary people, they are afraid. So let's put aside those illusions that uh, there is some quick, easy solution, even no nation, no, no funds will save us. Uh, this, is, this is a lie. So let's prepare ourselves for today and for the future. And let's not talk, please, let's not talk about the world as a sum of technical, architectural, economic parameters. It's not working. We are humans, we are irrational. Things that make us happy are intuitive. Let's talk about our you know, traumas, things that we lost, or even our hopes. Uh, because if we are to overcome this period, we have to talk about it. And I, I maybe I'm heading towards some kind of like collective uh, therapy and time because this, this can be a healing factor for us as nation or Europe. So this is my fault. But let me be even more vulgar. I don't think there is any nation or European Union, not even funds or design or, or art saving us. Not if the humanity will not come first, the language giving us hope, waking up every morning. And this humanity can be individual, but let me be even more specific. I think I'm talking about public interest, which is not the sum of individual interest. If we are to maintain any kind of future, we have to protect this public interest. And you can translate it as living environment, affordable housing, like uh, good aging, you know, high quality education, gender equality or safe, cities, uh, we have to protect it today so we have any kind of future. And this, these topics are for me, humanity and humanism in, in material form, right? And uh, I, I'm now fairly cynical, but uh, in my personality, cynicism is combined with optimism and it's working quite well for me. So I, I share some optimism, like uh, look at my country, Slovakia, like hundred years ago, we were merely we were not existing nation, part of uh, Upper Hungary, with not even language. We were living in cottages, agrarian, no education, no, no, no projections for the future. And in 100 years time, we are a country and we are a proud member of European Union. And this is a huge moder modernization jump we did in 100 years, which of course has terrible side effects with all those changes and wars, but we, but it's something that I, when I'm living now one year in Slovakia, it's something that I'm proud of. And it seems to me that people of my nation or European nation have this progress in our DNA. So that gives me optimism that we can overcome even this break, pandemics and going for the future with uncertain outcomes. So let me finish this way. I believe in that future where we will not separate humans from the environment, starting with our own feelings, 
well-being society and only that the design and funds will function and if new european bauhaus can provide like place for people who can convey this message to people around yourself and if it can be more than just top down uh, you know program of european union bringing money for nice conferences is a nice project then i i think i uh, will share my optimism even on this project thank you yeah thank you very much uh, and now i would like to hand over to paul thanks uh Mikhail, so we're running out of time, aren't we? Yeah, a bit. I, I'm going to be really short. Okay. okay. Um, the, first, the, the main thing I want to say is that I think the concept, the Bauhaus concept, the reason why it's potentially so important and why it's so powerful, and this includes amongst the cities that I work with across the world, is because it has the word house in it. Yeah, it's about living. It's about the concept of a good life. And if you think about policies on cities and this includes policies on culture and creativity they've been primarily focused on working you know dread the dreaded creative class they've been primarily focused on playing basically tourism and shopping i mean to a massive massive degree you know we we, we don't necessarily experience it in our professional lives because we work across the board but really the thinking is dominated has been dominated by those two concepts so rebalancing it and resetting it towards the concept of life and a good life for the citizens in your city and how culture and creativity play that that is in itself is a very very big thing to do and i would hope then that you would see a shift of policy focus and uh and money um as well um and then the second thing i want to say and, and this is probably the end is and i'm echoing a few people here including burn right is that you know the opportunity here is is not more programs not more projects you know uh, we're, we're very good out there in the world at doing programs and projects the, the opportunity is how do we redesign the systems you know how do we how, how do we how do we reshape the actual context and i just want to really really emphasize uh, something that burnt said and 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 and, and suggest that 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 this should be central to people's thinking uh, and that's the concept that, and that and that's property markets in most big cities probably in most cities property markets are massively dysfunctional in the sense that they do not serve the needs of the majority of people in that city yeah they are designed to benefit a very very small number of people many of whom actually don't even live in the city yeah and just addressing that one big issue and it has a huge consequences by the way for for culture and creative industries just in terms of you know where where the creative precariat live for example yeah just addressing that one thing uh, would be a huge achievement if you want to look at the work that the world cities culture forum is doing on this you can look on the website we have a, a whole program of work around infrastructure and property and then the other thing i would say is if i was gropius if, if i if, if we had gropius here if we had those people here now i would want them to to share their thinking on what they would do around data how would you design what's the bauhaus of data because as well as living in these dysfunctional property markets the people in our cities are also living in these kind of dysfunctional data universes yeah uh, where well, there's a massive imbalance between the data that they put into the system and the data they can pull out and how that benefits their lives and i'd be i'd be saying how can we get uh, how can we design something that's uh elegant simple functional uh and useful and to the majority of people that's that that's that's my second big systemic project to suggest thanks yeah thank you very much uh, the last but not least as i said already um, uh, i would like to hand over to angela and uh, joao to the airport thank you very much uh yeah, just one interview. Yes, I, I would like I would like to show you this picture, and and this could be about um, these ideas, uh, inclusive and sustainable. This is a, a picture. This is a painting. Uh, it's a Flemish painting that was uh, found some uh, years ago, not so many years ago. 
and it represents the city of Lisbon in the beginnings of the 16th century. Um, and it is a surprising scene because we see um, all races, uh, all uh, social classes, and even all religions, because we can see uh, a Jewish guy working in a in a bank at the end of the of the image, and uh, you can see uh, Christians in first uh, um, in first line, and uh, even some uh, Moors. Um, and well, this is the beginning of the 16th century, so it's the uh, uh, under Don Manuel the first who brought Inquisition into Portugal. So we could we could ask how how is it possible that we have this incredible asymmetry between the orientation, the political orientation of the country, and the real functioning of the of the city that this picture tra translates. And I think that the, the ma most important thing was that these people were living under such an incredible energy of um, innovation, of invention, uh, of, of new things and new opportunities, um, that all other things, all other differences uh, suddenly become um, secondary. And I think that we could be probably leaving something very similar to that. Um, and we, we, we personally, we think that uh, inclusive and sustainable are uh, two sides of the same coin, are practically the same thing, because one of the most important resources for the sustainability of the city uh, is, is people and their differences and the possibilities that they have to uh, put together their different talents and um, interests in the construction of a, um, of something common. Um, so w we do think that this new thing, this degree, extreme degree of innovation, this extreme uh, moment of, of change is, is, is here and uh, we think that we need to, to make us conscious of this change, of this incredible opportunity. Of course, this opportunity is not uh, new European Bauhaus, but new European Bauhaus could be the, the tool, the instrument that can uh, make the construction of the conscience of this, of this opportunity. Uh, Okay, so we can, yeah, pass, um, because that the um, inclusive, as, as Joel says, is always sustainable. Inclusive is not throw away any sources or resources, even not humans. And that is point, not humans, which moves to that, uh, that, uh, that topic. Uh, or our, our, our field could be part of the new house. Uh, so what is landscape? By definition, is the living environment of human beings, an artifact of continuous and qualitative construction guided by our ever-changing ability to transform the world. And transformation consists in, in the clever economy of using resources and be adaptive. As we saw in, in that photo, which is clearly an extreme situation uh, as a desert is, there's a village that exists only thanks to a strong adaptation adaptability, the right proficiency to manipulate soil and water in order to create uh, uh, agriculture and be self-sustainable. Um, it's about continuous construction of our habitat. It's about exploring nature to favor the humankind, which otherwise will disappear. And just to remind us, another famous place, Venice, the lagoon is a sophisticated machine, a century-long process of mainland management was all about redesign the rivers to conduct all the water and sediments from the mountains until to mounds. Not to extinguish the lagoon as a natural uh, process could do, could do over time. So it was uh, a community manipulation to strongly defend culture, the existence and the autonomy of, of an unique uh, city island. 
uh, a fragile state of balance, a compromise, uh, which move us to the to the other topic, cross and the other slide. So cross fertilization and what compromise is. So. Yeah. Well, um, we are used to 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 cross uh, disciplinary uh, strategies. Landscape is is a is about um, mixing things and understanding things through the uh, very high complexity of um, functionings and metabolisms and realities that only can be um, understood with the contribution of many different uh, looks. So we, we mix uh, usually in our work uh, sociology with botany, economics with, with geology, history with uh, future making uh, innovation and, and, and I think that we have very good um, methodological uh, skills to, to be able to do that. But one thing um, we have learned, it, it's not only about uh, putting uh, different people together talking about the same thing, it's trying to make the effort of understanding the, the, the point of view of the other that's the real uh, cross-field operation. And this is so important that in this world that is becoming morally divided between um, conservation and transformation, which is something that we strongly fight, um, it is even possible to harmonize through an intelligent project the two points of view that seem originally totally opposite. Thank you. And uh, so, what about uh, uh, creative aspect? And uh, as you all say, the greatest opportunity is allowing the orientation of fundamental uh, uh, cultural aspect, very centered on a conscious creation of a great community. And we saw that we will see that in the next slide, please. Um, we are in the sunset. Uh, of, of, of the body object page that created for a decade a, a, a culture of vanity and self-celebration. We are in the sunset of anthropocentric age, moving in unprecedented opportunity to build a more conscious and respectful way to live. Uh, and as we said before about architecture, creativity is an engine of every research and every discovery of this improbable connection, or connection improbables, as, as your marvelous name. So uh, if you, we pass to the next slide. Yeah, all this ferment energy research and projects, I think uh, appear as a down in this photo. That was a final presentation of our idea in 2090, always and always, <laughs> and I will, uh, used to be a splendid moment uh, of, of sharing. So it was three years before the pandemic experience. Yeah, three experiences or three ideas. Uh, I think that one, one interesting thing that pandemic uh, brought us is the clear idea that um, our our habitat is not the house. And we have been living with this idea even through publications uh, that are called Habitare and things like that, uh, that we're trying to, to connect the idea of living, the idea of uh, human habitat to the idea of home, to the idea of the house. And I think that, that this is a good opportunity because suddenly everybody understands that living is not about house. Living, we live in our rooms, we live in our houses, in, we live in our living rooms, but we also live in our streets uh, with, with neighbors. We live in our neighborhoods, we live in our squares, in our gardens, in our public spaces, and we live in our streets, and we live in our infrastructures, and we live in our production spaces. And uh, all together, they are called landscape. They constitute our territories of work, of leisure, of production, of transportation, uh, of rainwater drainage, of soil protection, of wild habitats even. So I think that we have to think about the spatial continuity of our territories. Um, 
now made up of very different spaces and treated in a very unequal way um, and try to understand them as one habitat uh, functioning together and um, deserving the same level of uh, attention uh, and spatial importance, exactly like our house. Then the second second possibility, the second uh, idea, the second theme. Uh, in general, most of all big operations in our cities are focused on big objects. And uh, they are centered in the vanity that surrounds this, these objects and the, their, their representation potential. Um, and we are losing the understanding of the whole system and the secondary spaces are generally put aside. So I think that we need uh, a higher um, level of uh, uh, system building through a huge transformation that can, uh, in a diffuse and transversal way, uh, put small actions and uh, interstices and insignificant spaces uh, in our in our uh, and in an important uh, position. Uh, many interventions could ensure coherence in a vast system, uh, producing the most effective results in terms of, for instance, ecological continuity. Facing climate change, for, in for example, in the film of salt storm water drainage, this could be of uh, crucial importance. But it is about how people live in cities, how we need a continuous space, and how small and insignificant spaces can be very important in the construction of this uh, of this system. Okay, and finally, moving on the, on the last slide, we consider the world transformation as a common matter that can be deeply conservative and defended each identity without losing the power of change. And we clearly understand that in this last photo in his Lanzarote, a vineyard grows on rich volcanic soil and protected from the wind in this kind of half moon depression. It also helped to save uh, uh, All this was um, accomplished despite uh, the hot, dry, inhospitable natural condition. We can be productive and progressive without renouncing care. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, a bit over time, but maybe we have uh, a few minutes for short reflections. So if everyone could just say one or two really key messages he took from the, from the discussion or would like to highlight or react to other colleagues, uh, this would be great. So we had the topics from the housing markets to solidarity to place making, impact policy making. So there is there is a plenty plenty of um, topics to react to. So everyone has something which resonates more uh, than others. So if we just uh, want to or uh, could have this reflection, then this would this would be great. Point just before I leave, yes, yes, which Charles. I thought was quite interesting, is really to identify what is the most catalytic lever that will actually make that systemic change. Because obviously, we only at the later point talked about obviously a completely different conception of things. And I do think the point about gentrification, the stroke property markets, is one of the main levers. Anyway, everybody, lovely to see you. See you soon somewhere. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, Charles. Bye. Yeah. So maybe, maybe if Matthijs could uh, just say one or two words. No, no one would. Joanna? I, 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 I would say it was really, really, really inspiring. inspiring, uh, inspiring. Uh, and I think this is what it's all about. So we have to get together and, and take the, the opportunity of this window that opens to, uh, to, to bring others in, you know, because we are so aligned, we, are, we share all, this, all these views and all these, you know, hopeful futures about housing and, and city planners. But what I, what I have to stress is really the important match of breaking the silence 
and working every day for for that for, for that for that um, you know that that goal. Uh, and I think that this is really a matter of daily by day uh, work within our own uh, um, different you know localities, different regions like Milota. So 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 inspiring, inspiring, uh, stresses. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So you if I could, I could, I could probably add something. I, I, I was very impressed uh, by some of the presentations that were made, and I, I think that I could use some reflection uh, about what I, uh, yeah. about what I heard. And and my my proposal is that if we really want that this moment is the beginning of something, the beginning of a process. Probably we could uh, reflect on the uh, arguments and presentations of everybody and try to put together something that could bring us back to a more deep talk in another moment. Uh, I, I would really need some digesting time in order to, to uh, rearrange everything. And th this was very rich and I, I, I missed uh, almost half. So I imagine that it was... Uh, twice as rich as I have uh, understood, and um, and I really think that this this deserves continuity and this deserves uh, uh, editing and organization and uh, uh, trying to understand what what are the overlapped uh, opportunities that were signed, and uh, it needs now some some work, some uh, organizing work and to get back again and move forward a little bit. Yeah, this is, yeah, just, that is, uh, please go ahead. No, no, yeah, no. So where, where I think, where I think it's, it really becomes interesting is the example that Bern brought about the parking, yeah? So it's, it's of course, you, you, people go to sleep at the place where you park your Porsche. But um, it, it is it is also uh, it's also about value creation. Yeah, so that's where it all starts. Matthias, Matthias, we we have a problems to hear you with the microphone. Okay, is it better now? Uh, not really. Is it better now. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's better. Yeah. Okay. So I think the example of burns of the parking lot is, is something that really fits to what I see in, in daily practice. You know. So I see this 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 change in the way of how place, how value and place are coming together. So there is this really strong uh, economical force, but the social aspects of place are actually. Uh, becoming more and more important because the digital world can mine it, the digital world can know geolocations, what people are communicating about what, at what place, at what time. Yeah? So that, that is the, 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 the economy has already a, is already ahead of it and they are really like registering what moods are there at what places. But the, the value of that in terms of social terms is extremely important because I see, for instance, examples where parking lots are, are, are used for Porsches during the day. In the, in the afternoon or in the evening, there is a, a, a mountain bike race in the thing. And then, uh, as, 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 he sa as, as Bernd says, the parking lot is then used by people to sleep in the night if you want it or not. It's, it, the informal aspect is, is a real big part of it. And, and to start realizing this context and also how these kind of different worlds can, can actually support each other, it, it, that is what the discussion today brought me, the importance of, of place and how can we make spaces that are sometimes digital, that are sometimes hybrid, that are sometimes yeah, in our communities and tribes, how can we make them even more anchored in places? And what is the function of culture and creativity in that? What, what creativity can we set up to, to generate processes to make people understand how important place truly is. And there I would say the, the remark on house, uh, I, I've been involved in, uh, in, 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 in Belfast, for instance, uh, in a really large debate about uh, yeah, Protestants and, 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 and Catholics and how you can do that. In that discussion, I've learned how, the, how 
truly important the place of, of, of home is. What me, does it really mean to be at home? The sense of feeling at home somewhere. That is, that is changing. People feel at home also at, at the internet, but there is, there is a, a, a sense, a, a change in the play, in, in where we feel at home and what is needed to be at home. And the, and the pandemic has speeded that up. And, and there is somewhere a point where all these kind of ideas more easily function together in terms of, of, uh, of the economy that can push it forward. Fantastic. Yeah. Gabu? Yeah. <clears throat> I think um, um, what was interesting to me is um, that um, I didn't uh, maybe expect that, um, uh, let's say, as, as I want to say it differently, I think we need to redefine creativity and maybe also what we, what we mean by creative cities, um, maybe in the sense that we have, we have learned that a certain idea of creative city which is valuable and important, but I do think that it actually lacks creativity in a larger scale. And this is why I brought in kind of the socialist part of, uh, of uh, uh, Gropius in terms of like, we need so much creativity and alternatives when it comes to, to the economy of houses, when it comes to the actual um, securing of existential, um, uh, existential safety and, and security for people. Um, and this is where I would say, where I would actually stretch if we would stick with creativity, which would be fine with me. I'm coming from a creative um, profession, architecture, but um, I'm in my writings and in my book, I really stretch kind of the conflictuality that we need to embed in creativity. We're not supposed to only be creative to make something that has already been decided nicer, but to actually be part of the creative process of deciding of uh, being part of the creative process of first of all having a large discussion about how our cities are going to and how place is being to, to be distributed before we design uh, before we decide if it's going to be then as a place making um, be made in wood or in steel yeah? so we need to be structurally creative if we stick with this word and this is what i would wanted really to push with my uh, look back in terms of also bringing kind of about uh, maybe structural other future of um, of um, housing at least, yeah? but that includes public space. That includes um, uh, generally, and it's a very global condition because the question is of course uh, why are we facing and we will face continuously. And it's not even a facing. It's like we live in a migration society, and there's an there, there's like if Europe doesn't it won't find uh, in uh, an easy way, kind of a creative way of being, like uh, of living together in this migration society, uh, then we, we should never talk about inclusion. So um, yeah, let's use all our creativity, but in a structural and broader sense. Thank you very much. Very, very important point. Melota, do you have anything to add? Maybe something to add on. I mean, like I kind of grasp, grasp all the presentation because they are so different. Uh, but Gabriel is always a good uh, resume person. I, I definitely think that, that housing is uh, uh, really, really the core. It's becoming less affordable and from this existential fear, all kinds of problems emerge, including not accepting cultural creativity because you live in Slovakia, we don't need culture, we don't put any money into that because this is not considered a value while housing still is. So if this creativity, whatever, can be in, implemented into uh, real life of people, whatever it means, we can sell it in different ways, then, then I think this is a way to go forward. But this, I, I don't know, like left, right, whatever. We need the social state, we need the security. If we don't have the stable society, it's going into real conflict. So, uh, uh, Gabi, you say socialistic part of creativity, I totally, uh, support it because for me it's not a political question it's a question of survival you know so uh i would like to stay away from this living left or right it's important to do it because we are so far in the extreme and it's going to get worse so it cannot be creativity for sake of creativity and us and and uh, those white people which we are not talking in here because we are the best maybe but, uh, it should go really 
to people. And maybe with this, we can get these human conditions, connect to them. Uh, my thoughts to this is uh, why I'm working to cover so well, because uh, we do public participation. And, and when we are trying to build uh, houses, which would be rental houses by the city, like first after uh, three decades, people start to tell us like, oh, wait, you, you are doing this house, but you are decreasing the value of my property. And it's capitalism talking, and we have to stop this, you know? And we have to stop this by saying this is public interest for all of you. And it so should, we have to no, be... Yeah. Yeah. It, should in, it should increase the value, and, but this <laughs> is what, why we need to work for it also, like uh, why, to, to change this um, uh, tendency. Yes, but my, my response, I don't want to even answer to this question. I say this, is, this discussion ends here because housing is not about uh, making your life uh, better for as investment. It's, if we go this narrative, then we'll go this capitalist way leading to nothing, you know? So that's why I think it has to be part of creativity, culture, whatever we are trying to convey and humanity uh, so that people feel stable, but also feel more generous because... To be honest, I feel I, I'm living in a very trashy society and now there's a lot of anxiety and greed and I'm like, like, full of it, you know, like, uh, we need to process it. Okay, that's, that's... Can I add something to you, uh, Milota, because I think not only should we in, instill creativity uh, or like broaden where we need creativity, we also must understand if we don't manage to have the infrastructure and the structure for people to to have time or like even to be free for creativity. We are lacking so many people's creativity by actually them not being able. Yeah? Yes. And, and this is something where I would say we really, if we really take serious what we call inclusive, everybody, including everybody. I mean, we have no idea about the level of creativity of so many people because they absolutely not even have a minute to bring it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so this would, I mean, I don't want to talk, um, this is nearly too uh, utilitarian, yeah? but, um, but basically just to make up this field and, and have everybody be part of it, that mm -hmm. would be amazing. Maybe the last thought from Matthijs? Yeah. What, yeah, what I also want to say is this data thing, is that basically there is really creativity needed because these big companies are basically eating us away, you know, they're really registering what we are doing already for, for 10, 15 years, and, and they are going to make use of it. And I think uh, creativity there, so like I have seen data war rooms in big cities where, where they are cooperating with people writing algorithms with Facebook and Twitter. And if you see what is what you are possible to, to make and to make visible in terms of, of human interaction, especially in terms of uh, sustainable behavior, if, if you make strange glitch, glitches between different databases that normally are not supposed to be connected, if you see what that makes visible and the impact of that, it also helps people to see data as a, and not as a, as a threat or as a basis for, for hate speech and, and, and data, and, but it can also help people to see uh, yeah, different thinking as a, as a safe place, as a place where you can nest and not, and not are, are going to be mined by the big companies that, that are going to... I, I think there is a real, uh, there is a real, uh, yes, a real step to make still. Uh, and, that, and I don't see that sufficiently in the current policies uh, developing. Thank you very much uh, for you all. Before I probably give a, a last word to Roberto, uh, I would like to say that from this conversation and presentations, we are going to make a, a decalogue or manifesto, like 10 points, what to uh, digest or uh, take from, from this conversation. And we would present them on 22nd, also on, on the last event of, of uh, the series of uh, parallel dialogues. So there will be a conclusion. So we circle it also, so you can say, uh, you can have a say to that. So you will see that. And now it was my great pleasure to have you all here and also for those who already left. And just last words to Roberto and then we Thanks, Michal. Uh, I have not uh, anything to add because uh, I'm, I'm very happy with, with, with this panel. Congratulations on your contributions, uh, really fantastic. 
uh, I have a lot of things uh, to, to, to think about because um, um, we, we need more time of course and, and we, we have we have uh, we have a long time to, to rate uh, the conclusions of our panels and, and to, to to hope that perhaps something is changing uh, I, I don't know but new European bank house is, is perhaps the best opportunity to 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 put creativity on, on, on the table on in, in the in the great in the great deals, uh, not only in, in the green deal, uh, I think is is the, the best opportunity in the last years, and we need to 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 use uh, to 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 be active in at this moment. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks again, and Begonia, if you can say anything to yes, to, yes, to I I will say a few words. So thank you. I think even we went over on time, I guess it has been interesting and inspiring to her all of us. So I think you won't re regret about have been attending the, this conversation this extra minutes. Not too much to say, actually. I just want to continue with, uh, with what you all said. If this, um, if this is to be the start of something, we need to continue to, to share all of our all our knowledge, perspectives, experiences. And I think this was just a brief conversation or discussion, but hopefully I think it will be the first of many more. So thank you for today's discussion and nice to meet you all. I I want to remember, by the way, that on Monday we are holding our six, um, let me, um, I'm going to start the screen, yeah. So on Monday, on the 14th of June, we are holding our six parallel dialogue and we are going to talk about education and human development for sustainability. It's going to be held by Navet Science Center and you have all the streaming links in in our website so if you want to attend it just go to our website and by the way also we are using the hashtag Gropius 2021 and the new European Bauhaus in our social media so if you want to serve something you just can tag us and also remember that as Michal told you uh, we are holding the last conversation or common reflection on the 22nd of June and even the active participant of this group will be Michal. You are all invited to attend, so I hope we will see you then. And once again, thank you, thank you all, and thank you Michal for this fantastic panel of experts. So thank you and bye. Yeah, thank you very much and have a nice weekend. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Thank, bye. You. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.